Good afternoon, all. Sorry to keep you waiting. Nothing has happened on time in the Senate today. I thought we abolished Senate time. We're doing our very best, and we're uh, well ahead of old Senate time. Uh, just to make sure your microphones are working, uh, Don Harmon, uh, President of the Illinois Senate, Democrat from Oak Park. Uh, thanks for coming down. Uh, we came to Springfield today in the hopes of uh, passing a landmark nation-leading climate bill. Uh, we came up a little short today, but uh, we will get it done. Uh, I was reminded from all of our caucus meetings uh, and all the different views that were shared uh, among the Senate Democrats uh, of a lesson I learned about energy legislation long ago. We have a much, much better chance of passing a major bill when we have three ingredients. When we have the support of environmental activists, when we have the support of organized labor, and when we have the support of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we are this close to reaching that agreement, and I am confident that we will get that done. There are still some points of contention between two critical constituencies, between labor and the environmental activists. I believe they're going to be continuing to meet as early as this evening to try to work out those differences. And uh, the Senate stands ready, willing, and able to return uh, as soon as an agreement is reached. So happy to try to take your questions. I've got Senator Bill Cunningham here with me, too, who's been lead in the uh, uh, energy working group who can handle some technical so, questions if you have them. So on June 1st, you sent her a statement. We also stand with the governor on decarbonization targets that need to be in a final deal. Later that day when you were answering my question about Prairie State, you answered in part, my caucus members are assuring me generally that they're comfortable with the 2035 date. A few members might not be able to vote for it because of, it, of impacts on their districts, but I'm confident we'll have the votes to support the decarbonization. The next day you tweeted, reaffirming that we stand ready to return when the when governor's plan ready for action and to support agreement reached to save jobs our goal all along to, and stand with the governor on decarbonization targets needed. What has changed between then and now that, you know, the the plans, you know, it seems like they have gained the upper hand here. Uh, I stand by those comments, and I know that sounds a little odd, but it, over the last 36 hours, much progress has been made, but at the same time, uh, there was a, a much greater emphasis placed on some of the uh, interim decarbonization targets for uh, natural gas plants. Uh, that was not part of the conversation uh, a week and a half ago, and that has caused some consternation. And I'm confident we're going to be able to work that out. Uh, we just weren't able to work that out today. Can you explain why it's imperative to include an expiration date on fossil fuels? Couldn't we just expand wind and solar now, why, why, are those, why are those two inextricably intertwined, if that, if that makes sense? Uh, that's a fine question. Um, I, I think we can do both, but I, I, I think that the, um, the climate can't wait for action on the dirtiest sources of energy, and so putting a, a finite horizon on, on those plants makes sense. It creates planning and it creates incentive to change practices. Uh, but that's been part of the problem is that some of these uh, interim targets, uh, let me take a step back, all of the plans call for decarbonization. All of the plans, all of the stakeholders are preparing for decarbonization uh, with coal going offline in 2035 and gas going offline in 2045 unless there is some significant technological change that allows them to operate without polluting. Um, those are important targets and we stand ready and, and willing to support those. Um, but the predictability issue is one that's very real. And don't forget the Clean Energy Jobs Act has always been about jobs. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, Illinoisans are working at uh, good paying jobs, both the folks who are in the industry today and the folks who are going to take those clean energy jobs going forward, and that we don't just create a situation where we end up shutting down Illinois plants and importing dirty energy from other states. Just to follow up on that, what, what gives you any degree of confidence, though, that or natural gas can actually capture and bury carbon? I mean, what, is there, is there, what, what gives you any reason to believe that that's realistic? I, I don't know that it is today. I don't know that it's not. Uh, but I think setting those dates, you either clean up or you close, is a reasonable policy position. Are there a number of um, lawmakers in your caucus that have said blatantly they won't vote for it in the, in the form it's in now? Is that why it's held up? The caucus made it very clear uh, to all of us that we don't want to vote uh, for something that pits us uh, in the middle of a fight between friends, between key constituencies, between organized labor 
and the environmental community. There is a deal to be reached, and we just need to get them back at the table and push a little bit harder. I'm confident we're going to be able to do that. Do you have a number on the uh, number of lawmakers that have said they wouldn't? I, I am confident that the bill as proposed would not have passed today. Why does it have to be an omnibus bill? I mean, you've got to agree it on some major parts here. We're going to pass the parts that you can agree on and come back to decarbonization later. Uh, I think decarbonization is a critical ingredient in the larger package, and I, I don't think we can move uh, this piecemeal. Uh, some things you can in, in this space. I don't know that you, you can uh, move one piece without the other. As you understand, Luke, can you outline the differences that still exist between labor and environmental groups? I think there are two fundamental agreements. One, I think, is uh, close to resolved. It's on how to merge uh, labor protections and uh, equity issues, how the prevailing wage would apply uh, in, in the new industries that come online. I think that's going to be worked out. Um, I think everybody is in agreement on this, the end goal of the second uh, issue, which is the uh, 2045 goal for decarbonization of gas plants. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about what's going to happen between now and 2045, and the, the most current proposal would have started closing plants um, in the next few years. Uh, there's much talk, for instance, about hydrogen coming online as an alternative to natural gas. I think most of my caucus would like those plants to be able to adapt that new technology and go to a zero emission model. But if they're shut down because of an arbitrary date that was set forth in law today, that opportunity won't exist. So that, those are the two main areas. Doesn't carbon capture cost a lot more than a carbon tax? Why are you more open to the carbon capture than the carbon tax? Uh, first of all, uh, we don't know what carbon capture technology is going to be like in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. Uh, I've never been opposed to a carbon tax. I, there's a concern about Illinois uh, being an outlier and uh, imposing a carbon tax unilaterally without some a regional or national model. Um, Were you surprised when the governor offered uh, the 2045 date for Prairie State and CWLP to close their plants? Uh, I, I confess I was a bit surprised. The governor had been pretty clear, and, and we had started to um, uh, look for alternative models to some sort of special treatment. Um, but again, I, I, I think that that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it will uh, allow plants to stay online. I'm not sure it won't. So uh, I, I, there's just so much we don't know over the next 25 years. Was that one of the factors that threw a wrench in, in finalizing a, a proposal today? No, it, it, it really was the, the, uh, the consternation over the interim steps on the, uh, the natural gas plants. Uh, there are significant investments and significant jobs associated with those plants. Um, and, you know, people could be out of a job on Monday if we pass that bill today. So that's the thing, that 2045 date, that's, that represents a move not just from 2035, but from 2030, meaning, you know, the governor and environmental groups have already moved 15 years. And, you know, they're complaining that labor has not moved at all, that labor not only has not moved, but also just isn't offering much. Uh, you know, they're, you know, either saying, Here's some language, you know, up to you to fix it. I'm sure they would disagree with this characterization. This is what, you know, environmental groups have been telling me. Or not offering language at all. So, you know, is, is labor pulling their weight here in these negotiations? Both sides have moved considerably towards the middle. And both sides are operating in good faith. Both sides have legitimate, credible positions, and they're advocating uh, vigorously for them. Um, the environmental act activists have been uh, very thoughtful, um, and, and they, are, they are asking for things that d don't exist today because they have to. That's how we're going to change the future. Uh, the flip side, labor is being asked to support the closing of plants and the elimination of jobs. Those are things that they have today. That might be the toughest vote in Springfield, tougher than voting to raise someone's taxes, is voting to say next month or next year you don't have a job. These are very real concerns for very real people. Isn't it possible that local cities and towns just made a really bad bet on coal? Well, I think that they did make a very bad bet on coal. Uh, but uh, they're in that spot right now, and there are uh, folks that represent those communities and those taxpayers who are going to be on the hook. I, I, I really want to emphasize, I, th I think we're in a position where the, the, 
uh, the coal issues are largely settled. Uh, today we're talking about a path through uh, the natural gas uh, decarbonization, and I'm confident we're going to get there. So how soon then, because, you know, Exelon has repeatedly um, you know, threatened to close those three plants, they have to buy fuel pretty darn soon, and, um, you know, obviously the part where you would have maybe issued a moratorium didn't happen in the so-called skinny bill today. So how soon and, you know, how real is the threat from Exelon, even though, yes, the subsidy has been settled, but if you don't do everything in an omnibus bill, you know, could you really wait till August? Um, I don't think we're going to have to wait till August. I think parties are going to sit down again as early as this evening and, and recommence negotiations. And I think there's a fairly clear path to a relatively rapid resolution. Uh, that said, um, Exelon is on the cusp of a $700 million subsidy. If they close plants out of spite tomorrow, they were going to close those plants anyway. So I think we have a little bit of time here, uh, and if we don't, it's not because of the failure to act legislatively today. We'll be back this summer, I predict. Uh, and well, we'll going off Hannah's question, I, I have many viewers in the Rockford area that work at the Byron plant that are waiting for this to happen. Well, what do you tell those people that are that begging for a decision here in Springfield? Uh, we wanted to help them today, but I want to remind those folks the General Assembly is not trying to close those plants. Exelon is threatening to close the plants. We're trying to help them. Uh, and we're prepared to do something very significant. Um, I'll bite my tongue on some other thoughts, but we're the ones trying to help them, and we will help them. Uh, but it's Exelon who's threatening to close the plants, not the General Assembly. Can you, can you expand a little bit upon some of the progress made uh, with regards to coal? Is it uh, the governor moving to that 2045 day? Uh, are there some other issues that were resolved, uh, perhaps with... Uh, helping pay off some of the bonds that some of these communities have taken out to, to help pay for these plants? I, I think everybody has digested the fact that coal is going to have to go offline in 2035 um, unless some significant technology improvements uh, become available and affordable. Uh, and I, th I think people are, are coming to terms with that. Um, that that's, that's good. I think really the, the, the conversations over the last 36 hours have revolved around this newfound emphasis on the, uh, the pace of decarbonization in the natural gas space. Again, these are things that can be worked out, but it was a, a, a relatively uh, a new addition to the conversation and added with some enthusiasm. So uh, it's just going to take a little time to, di to digest that as well and to get to yes. Was it, worth holding out, was it worth holding out beyond May 31st now? Do you think that this is a better product now, or do you wish that you had struck a deal back then? I know that there was all sorts of talk about uh, a May 31st deal. The governor reached an agreement with Exelon uh, uh, several hours before we were scheduled to adjourn. There was no bill. There was no deal to derail. There was an agreement in principle. Uh, we needed that time, and I think the bills that are uh, under consideration now are far better for that time, and I think they'll be even better still when we come back to pass it. So that's another thing. I mean, you know, natural gas is now the sticking point, you say, uh, and for the last two weeks it was cold. And obviously before that, Exelon. So was it, you know, if there was never then going to be a, plan, a, a deal struck by May 31st, I don't even know what my question is. Like, I, I just, you know, don't you feel like, one, you're going around the legislative process because it, it you know, it was supposed to be done. Uh, two, you know, you're giving those to industries an opening that they would have not had before. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess my, my, let me go back. If they are now taking advantage of these openings that they're having, why weren't they then, you know, putting significant resources into media strategy, you know, uh, trying to build grassroots support months ago? Uh, you're asking some questions that some other people are going to have to answer. What I would tell you is that the Energy Working Group, the bipartisan, bicameral working group, uh, worked for months on a framework. Uh, the biggest sticking point originally was the subsidy for Exelon, and the governor negotiated that with Exelon in the closing hours of the General Assembly. Um, we had anticipated, and part of my commitment was the assumption that we would take that 
uh, agreement on, on the nuclear subsidy and insert it into the framework that the working group had been preparing. Um, but you've demonstrated the complexity of this issue. If you solve one problem by disrupting the status quo in another area, you just create another problem. We'll get through this, but this is, this is not at all atypical for energy legislation. There are lots of competing interests and a lot of uh, uh, complicated uh, components, and fixing one often dislodges something in another. But so, we'll get there. Senator Cunningham, uh, if you want to speak to this, uh, now solar is starting to sweat. They think they have a real deadline coming up. Well, what is the real deadline there? You know, if, if I can just get back to a point that the Senate President just made, I'll take my mask off if you don't mind. Um, there was, we've had this bipartisan working group in place, okay, that has been working on drafting a bill for weeks, for a couple months. That is radically different than the last time we passed an energy bill here. Those negotiations did not go on in a room in the Stratton building. They went on in Exelon's headquarters. That was the last place people met to pass a comprehensive energy bill. This has been a completely different approach. And as the President said, we're, we're really close to the finish line. And we're really confident we're going to get there. So the question about solar, now, they, they're starting to worry about this cliff that's coming up. So yeah, so by uh, August 31st, there, there's, a, there's a rollover fund that has about $300 million in it um, that has to be refunded if it's not spent by then. We are confident we will take care of that. There, it's always been the, int the intention to take care of that, the bill. There's really not a lot of argument about that. Um, the, the question is the timing. But as long as we get back here this summer and reach an agreement, we will make sure that $300 million is appropriated for solar and wind projects. But already, you know, it's been six months since uh, community solar, that fund, that tranche of funding ran out. And, you know, they say every day, like, you know, our jobs are disappearing, we can't count. So how much more, how much longer do you, can they? Well, again, the, these funds, the function of the last energy bill, are to be in place until August 31st. So that is the deadline for us to take action on that. And we're obviously very much, um, very much focused on getting this done. And, and I think we will. There, there is no disagreement about these rollover funds from anyone. They need to be appropriated, so and we will do that. Is it possible the House takes something up tomorrow, or is it going to have to start at the Senate? I, I, I can't really comment as to what the House the might, to the might do. Group that say, well, I guess climate change can't wait. Well, you know, I, I don't think anyone really has that attitude here in the General Assembly. That's something we really want to work on and something we really want to get done and something we're really close to. I think that, you know, you, you need to look. There, there's a very simple explanation for why we're here right now. Two of the most important Democratic constituency, constituency groups are in disagreement, environmental activists and organized labor. That creates problems for Democratic legislators. It's, it's the second we bridge that gap, I think we'll have a bill. And I think we'll have that bill before the summer's up. But isn't that something that, you know, you guys should have seen coming and tried to Well, we did see it coming. And oh, yeah. that's, and, and, but uh, solving these problems is hard. That's why we convened a, a working group, you know, to, to get at these problems. Let me get Sarah's question. And sure. Take Great. Um, Well, every bill passes in about 60 seconds, but all of the work that goes into that preparation of that bill uh, is laborious. And so uh, the, the members of the General Assembly, Democratic and Republican, uh, had, had seen the ingredients. So uh, it, it's an easy talking point for my Republican colleagues to claim we passed it at 2 in the morning in, in 30 seconds or 60 seconds. But every bill we pass, the roll calls, even with the remote voting, just don't last that long. So thank you all very much. We'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.